and welcome to the Egypt Travel Podcast of the Future. I'm the new AI bot who will be replacing John as host from now on, since I and my virtual colleagues in the artificial intelligence world now know more than any human anyway, and will be much better at advising you on travel and at helping you plan trips to places all over the world. Just joking, everybody. Don't worry. AI has not taken over this podcast and won't be doing so either anytime soon. In fact, this episode is going to be all about how AI and ChatGPT aren't going to be able to help you with comprehensive trip planning to destinations like Egypt, and plenty more, I'm now convinced. I've been testing out ChatGPT over the past couple of months to see what exactly it comes up with when it's asked to put together itineraries for different types of trips to Egypt. Now, I have to admit that I started this little experiment with a lot of optimism. I had the bright idea that a lot of our custom itinerary work that we do at my travel company and tour operator here in Egypt, Egypt Elite, could possibly be outsourced to ChatGPT. Unfortunately, the results weren't just unhelpful. They were misleading at best and downright dangerous at worst. When I started looking through some of these suggested itineraries that ChatGPT kept spitting out for me, even after detailed prompts and instructions, I thought that this is going to be something I need to share publicly in a podcast episode because it is a perfect illustration of the limits of artificial intelligence. While it may be helpful for planning trips to and around places like the 50 U.S. states or Western Europe or other developed countries like Australia and New Zealand, what AI tools and ChatGPT aren't able to process and access is the information that's not published on a website somewhere that it can scrape and factor into its analysis. Because that's the biggest problem with planning travel to and around places like Egypt and other developing world destinations to begin with. Anyone can search for the most efficient route to get from Aswan to Luxor, for example, and see on Google Maps that the Western Desert Highway only takes about two and a half hours, or that you can get from Luxor to the Red Sea in about three hours by road. And ChatGPT can scrape and analyze that same information online that you can easily find yourself with a little searching. The AI just speeds it up for you and saves you time. But at the end of the day, it's going to make the same mistakes that everyone else makes. In other words, it's going to assume that what it finds online is all there is to know. And with planning travel to and around a place like Egypt, that would be a big mistake. For example, Nothing online tells you, and therefore ChatGPT can't know and factor in for you, that foreigners are not allowed on the Western Desert Highway. And the minute you hit the first military checkpoint on that highway, you'll be turned around and sent straight back to Aswan. In fact, you wouldn't even make it onto that highway or to that checkpoint, because no one locally would agree to take you from Aswan to Luxor on that route, because everyone there just knows that foreigners are not allowed to take that shortcut highway. You know where else foreigners are not allowed to travel? On the Canada Safaga Highway after 6 p.m. That's the road that leads from Luxor to the Red Sea across the eastern desert. Does Google Maps tell you that the road closes at 6 p.m.? Nope, because it doesn't know. It only closes to foreigners then because you have to show a transit permit at the checkpoint to get onto the road, and the permit says plain as day that you're a foreigner, and foreigners are not allowed past the checkpoint after 6 p.m., for their own safety. That's not written anywhere though, and no one will tell you that. We just all know it and we plan around it when we need to take a guest on that route and many other routes in Egypt. And everyone just knows this from experience. But you know who doesn't know that? ChatGPT or any AI tool, because that along with a million other unwritten rules about traveling around Egypt are not published anywhere. These million little nuances about where you can and cannot go, how you can and can't get there, when you can go and when you can't, when you should go and when you shouldn't, and perhaps most importantly, where you should go and where you should not. These aren't written down in some neatly readable and scrapable rule book on the internet. We know these things from personal experience, living and working and traveling in Egypt for decades, and from knowing and working with officials here on the ground in Cairo and all over the country, and honestly, These things even change in a place like Egypt. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with colleagues and with people who work in government 
and especially when it comes to the tourism ministry and the tourism police and the security apparatus here in Egypt that goes something like this. Okay, here's the X, Y, and Z that's required for this. And then they say, oh wait, now you need X, W, and Z. And you're like, why not Y? And they're like, well, now it's W. Oh, that changed last week. How do you know? Somebody in the ministry told you. Well, it just makes no sense, but this is just how things go here in Egypt. Here's another example. Let's say you want to do something and it requires X, Y, and Z. So you bring X, Y, and Z to the office and you expect to proceed. Then you get there and they say, great, you got X, Y, and Z, but where's A? Well, you didn't tell us we need A, only X, Y, and Z. Well, you need A too. So you go get A and then you come back and they're like, this looks great, but you're still missing B and C. So you go get B and C, you come back again. They're like, that's great, but you need M. And uh, that's all right, though. We'll let M slide. Wink, wink. This type of stuff happens in Egypt all the time. When we need a special site visit, a vehicle registered, when we're transferring ownership of something, booking some big event venue, virtually anything. This is just life in a place like Egypt. It's not specific to Egypt. It's all over the developing world. But this isn't the type of thing that AI can know. At least not it until it has the ability to scan the brains of an entire population to put all of this information into its outputs. Believe me, I'm a huge fan of ChatGPT and AI. I've tested it out for a lot of things. And for example, it does a great job of summarizing Egyptian history. That information is out there. It's printed. It's online. It's readable. It's searchable. It's scrapable. There aren't a million consequential missing facts out there on some things. But when it comes to planning travel to and around the developing world, at least I've found that ChatGPT and AI have fallen flat, and potentially dangerously so too, if it's telling you to go through places that you cannot legally go to or that aren't safe for you to go to, which may have been safe before but aren't now. I'm not trying to scare you off of Egypt or travel or AI. Seriously, I'm a huge fan of all of those, and I hope that there can be synergies in the future. But right now, I'm seeing some companies jumping on the buzzword bandwagon, and I know that pretty soon that will mean people will be relying on itineraries spit out by ChatGPT to plan trips to and around Egypt, and they're going to get turned around at various points and denied permits and just wind up high and dry because they weren't smart and they didn't have on the ground resources to listen to and learn from, like you all are doing, being smart, doing your homework, and taking advice from experienced sources. So let me run through a couple of the itineraries that ChatGPT spit out for me recently, and let me talk through what it got right and what it missed the mark on. Okay, so in this test, I gave ChatGPT the prompt that said, pretend you are an expert on travel to Egypt and an expert on local travel, logistics, and tourism in Egypt. Create a 10-day itinerary for me as a tourist to see all the major historic and cultural sites and monuments. And here's what it spit back out for me. All right, it says, Certainly, Egypt is a fascinating country with a rich history and culture that dates back thousands of years. Here's a suggested 10-day itinerary that covers all of the major historic cultural sites and monuments in the country. Okay, let's run through this. Day one, Cairo. Pretty normal. Everybody, most people start in Cairo. Arrive in Cairo and check into your hotel. Visit the Egyptian Museum of Antiquities to see the treasures of Tutankhamun and other important artifacts from ancient Egypt. Take a long walking tour of historic Islamic Cairo, uh, including the citadel of Saladin and Al-Azhar Mosque. Okay, um, not bad for a first day. Most people want to see the pyramids on the first day. Um, in fact, I'd say 95% of people go to the pyramids on their first full day in Egypt. This itinerary assumes that you're going to arrive in the morning. Uh, you can only do touring if you arrive, if your flight lands in the morning, because remember the sites are going to close about five o'clock. So if your flight arrived at one, two, 3 PM, this itinerary is already crap because you won't make it to the Museum of Egyptian Antiquities uh, or the Citadel of Saladin by 5 p.m. or 3 or 4 p.m. to give you enough time to actually be in there. You could now take the Islamic Cairo part uh, and Al-Azhar Mosque could fit on that first day, even if you have an afternoon flight landing. 
because those are evening things. They're, uh, Old Cairo is a neighborhood. You could walk through it in the evening. In fact, it's preferable to walk through in the evening because the lights are on. Um, the people are buzzing. People are out. Uh, you can't go in al Asar Mosque that late, but uh, you can see it from the outside, so that's fine. Okay, so that's day one. I wouldn't do it that way, but that's what it's telling you to do. Uh, it says day two, Cairo and Giza. Visit the Great Pyramids of Giza. Uh, by the way, th there are no Great Pyramids of Giza. There is a Great Pyramid of Giza. The Great Pyramid is the wonder of the ancient world. That's the Pyramid of Khufu, the biggest one. But it says visit the Great Pyramids of Giza uh, and the Sphinx, some of the most iconic landmarks in Egypt. Explore the ancient ruins of Memphis, the former capital of Egypt. Take a sunset camel ride through the Sahara Desert. Okay. Visit the pyramids, great. Sphinx, great. They're collocated. Uh, I wouldn't do it again on my second day. I'd do it on my first day, but not a big deal. However, the fact that it recommends Memphis as a secondary site is really weird. I'd say Memphis would be the fourth thing on an itinerary out in Giza after Giza, Saqqara, and Dashur. And by the way, when I say Giza, I'm talking about the government. Um, the pyramids are also in Giza, right outside of the city of Giza. So the things that I would prioritize out in Giza are the pyramids, Saqqara, the necropolis, and Dashur, where the Red and Bent Pyramid are. Memphis would be at least fourth, if not fifth or sixth, but ChatGPT is recommending the pyramids in Memphis. Okay. It's also saying take a sunset camel ride after that through the Sahara Desert. You're not going to be able to do that. Um, you can take camel rides in the pyramids compound. You can take them immediately outside of the pyramids compound. You're not going to find camels down in Memphis to take, and you're certainly not going to be allowed to take them out into the Sahara Desert. The desert around Saqqara, Dashur, and Memphis is a military zone, and you're quickly going to get intercepted by the military if you try to sashay on a camel out into the desert out there. That's all military land. But ChatGPT is telling you to do it, so okay. It says day three, Luxor. Take an early morning flight to Luxor. Visit the Karnak Temple Complex, okay, that's Karnak, which is the largest temple, one of the largest temple complexes in the world. That's true. Explore the Valley of the Kings where many pharaohs were buried. That's true, but I wouldn't do those. Let's see, does it give you, okay, so it's given you two days in Luxor. The next day is Luxor also. But if you have two days in Luxor, why are you going to cram East and West Bank into one day? All of the tombs are on the West Bank side. There's more than just the Valley of the Kings. The temples are on the East Bank side. There's more than just Karnak. So I don't know why you would just go to Karnak and Valley of the Kings in the same day when you have two days in Luxor. We usually split Luxor for those who have two days, and almost everyone does, into an East Bank day and a West Bank day. You're making a lot, you're covering a lot of extra terrain if you are going over to the West Bank, back to the East Bank to your hotel, then back to the West Bank, then back to the East Bank. It's just unnecessary. Um, so if you have two days in Luxor, there's no reason to cram everything into a joint East Bank, West Bank day. Uh, on its day four, second day in Luxor, it says visit Luxor temple, which was dedicated to the God Amun and is one of the best preserved temples in Egypt. Um, yeah, it's one of them. Then it says, take a hot air balloon ride over the Nile and the Valley of the Kings. Okay. Again, the hot air balloons are done from the West Bank. Luxor Temple is on the East Bank. So two days in a row here, it has you going West Bank, East Bank, West Bank, East Bank. Uh, that's a lot of unnecessary back and forth, back and forth. Um, everybody does an East Bank day and a West Bank day. This makes no sense. Also, if you go to Luxor Temple and then you try to take, you can't take a hot air balloon ride after Luxor Temple. The hot air balloon rides are done in the morning. They're done at sunrise. They're strictly, strictly regulated as to the times they can occur. Uh, most companies are allowed two to three flights a day. They all have to occur in the morning, and that's for safety reasons. If the temperature gets too hot, it's too dangerous to fly hot air balloons. And so the government makes them do them at certain hours of the morning, before the sunrise usually, or right after the sunrise. And um, if you try to go to Luxor Temple and then do a hot air balloon, first of all, you're not going to find a hot air balloon. Um, 
because they don't take off that late. And then if you did find some rogue balloon that was taken off that late, run, because it's going to be dangerous to take it. That's why the government doesn't let them occur, doesn't let the flights occur later in the day. ChatGPT says to do it. So, okay, day five, Aswan. It says take a morning train to Aswan. Not a bad idea, especially now that they have the new uh, Talgo trains in Egypt. Those are really nice and luxurious. Train rides between Luxor and Aswan are no longer jank. Uh, it's actually not a bad idea these days. Uh, when you get to Aswan, it says visit Philae Temple, which was dedicated to the goddess Isis and was moved to its current location to avoid being flooded by the Aswan High Dam. That is true. Take a Feluca, traditional wooden boat, ride on the Nile River at sunset. I have no problem with that day. That's all good. Take a morning train to Aswan, perfectly fine. When you get there, visit Philae Temple. That is probably the number one thing to visit in the city of Aswan. Um, then later, a, a Feluca sunset ride on the Nile is exactly what I recommend. I don't actually, well, if you want to do a Feluca ride, Aswan and Luxor are the places to do it, but I would always have people do it in Luxor. There's a lot of reasons for that. But the second best option is Aswan. If you can't do it in Luxor, if you don't have time, um, Aswan's okay, but I would do it in Luxor. And there's reasons for that. Uh, day six, Abu Simbel. It says, take a day trip to Abu Simbel to see the massive rock-cut temples of Ramses II and his queen. Return to Aswan in the evening. Okay. Uh, you cannot return to Aswan in the evening. Um, it doesn't suggest, it doesn't say here if you're going by road or by air. So you'd have to book, uh, plane tickets in advance, certainly. But even if you're going by road, you have to get a special permit to go to Abu Simbel by road at least 48 hours in advance. You can't just show up and say, I want to go to Abu Simbel tomorrow, or I want to go to Abu Simbel today and be allowed to go. You have to have a special permit to make the road trip there if you're going by road at least 48 hours in advance. ChatGPT doesn't know that because it's not published anywhere. Um, and then it says, return to Aswan in the evening. You can't do that. Um, the checkpoint back to Aswan closes, like on the road back to Aswan, closes at 4 p.m. You have to be past the checkpoint by 4 p.m. Otherwise, you have to spend the night in Abu Simbel. Um, the way we do Abu Simbel is you go early in the morning, you you end up coming back around uh, noon if you're going by road, because it's going to be about three and a half to four hours to get back. You have to be past the Aswan checkpoint by four. Uh, so you want to leave some time in case you need to stop for the bathroom or something slows you down. So you can't, like you're leaving by noon at the latest. So when this says that you're going to be able to go uh, I presume it means by road, and then you're going to return to Aswan in the evening. Uh, no, ma'am, Pam, it's not going to work. Uh, but again, nobody, there's nowhere you can, where it's published that the checkpoint is closed at four. Um, the, the other big reason we do Aswan so early is because of the heat. You don't want to be in, As in, in I'm sorry, Abu Simbel, uh, the heat. You don't want to be in Abu Simbel at 2, 3, 4 p.m. Um, unless you're staying overnight there and you have a hotel that you can go into and survive the As uh, Abu Simbel is extremely far South in Egypt. It's only uh, about a stone's throw from the border with Sudan. That's how far South it is. So you don't want to be out there in the afternoon. You can't be out there driving back in the evening. Chat GPT is steering you wrong here. Okay. Day six was Abu Simbel. Now it says day seven, Alexandria. It says, take a morning flight to Alexandria. Visit the Bibliotheca Alexandrina. It's the Library of Alexandria. A modern library that pays homage to the ancient Library of Alexandria. Explore the ancient Roman amphitheater and the catacombs of Como Shakafa. So those three sites are not, um, not bad at all for Alexandria. But there's a big red flag here. You can't fly from Aswan to Alexandria. Um, I mean, you can connect in Cairo, but you really can't even do that because, well, you can't do that and do this itinerary because the only flight every day from Cairo to Alexandria, and it's been this way for a long time, 
is late at night. It arrives in Alexandria at like about midnight or 1 a.m. I want to say about midnight. Um, and so obviously you can't fly to Alexandria. So it's telling you fly to Alexandria in the morning. I presume that means fly out of Aswan in the morning and back to Cairo. And then you're going to have a 12 to 15 hour layover in Cairo to take your midnight flight, 11 p.m. flight to Alexandria, the one a day there is. And you're not going to be able to do anything because it's midnight. It's the middle of the night when you get there. It's 2 a.m. when you get to your hotel. The airport in Alexandria is like an hour outside of the city. Um, so you certainly can't visit the Bibliotheca Alexandrina, the Roman Amphitheater, and the Catacombs in that same day. Not possible. But of course, it doesn't know this. Um, the next day, it still has you in Alexandria, day eight. It says, visit the Alexandria National Museum, which has a wide collection of artifacts and objects to showcase the history of Alexandria. Take an afternoon flight back to Cairo. Um, you can certainly do some more visiting. Well, you're going to have to do all your visiting the next day in Alexandria because you arrived at your hotel at 2 a.m. the night before. And uh, all these things that told you to visit that afternoon, you're going to be visiting the next day. Um, all the things that actually told you to visit in Alexandria are things worthwhile. However, it did leave off one major thing. And I would say probably arguably the biggest thing in Alexandria, it left off of this itinerary. The old lighthouse of Alexandria was Egypt's second wonder of the ancient world. It no longer stands, but the site of it is where a medieval fortress was built. And the site of the old lighthouse of Alexandria is probably one of the biggest tourist attractions and sites to visit in Alexandria. This doesn't even tell you about it. So it's called Kite Bay Fortress. Um, it's where the Lighthouse of Alexandria was before it collapsed. And um, some of the stones are still the, the foundation for the fortress. Anyway, it's a big site to visit. It's a must-visit site in Alexandria. This itinerary doesn't even tell you about it. It completely leaves it out. Then it says, take an after... You probably know what I'm going with this one. Take an afternoon flight back to Cairo. Remember how I told you there's only one flight a day between Alexandria and Cairo? Well, if the flight from Cairo to Alexandria leaves, actually, the flight from Cairo to Alexandria is like 11 p.m. or midnight, and then the plane parks in Alexandria overnight, and the only flight from Alexandria back to Cairo is at about 5 in the morning, 5 or 6 in the morning the next day. I think it's 5 a.m. So there is no afternoon flight back to Cairo. The only flight would be at five in the morning, which means you would have missed all the sites in Alexandria because you would have flown down there, according to what they tell you, at midnight, flown out of it at 5 a.m., and I guarantee you there's no tourist sites or anything to see open from midnight to 5 a.m. in Alexandria. So it has you missing all of Alexandria and making a bunch of ridiculous flights. Okay, then it says day nine. So you would have to take a train or be driven back to Cairo. You can't take a flight like it says. Day nine, it has you back in Cairo. It says visit at the Citadel Visit the citadel of Saladin. It told you to do that on day one, actually. So I'm not sure why it's telling you to do uh, things twice. But anyway, it has you visiting the Citadel. If you'd visit anything twice, I'd say it would be the museum, the main museum there, the Antiquities Museum. Um, or the pyramids, maybe one of the bigger sites. The Citadel of Saladin is not something I've ever heard of anyone visiting twice. Um, uh, then it says explore Coptic Cairo, including the Hanging Church and Ben Ezra Synagogue. Shop for souvenirs at the Khan Khalili. That um, is a good recommendation. Exploring Coptic Cairo is a very unique uh, thing to do. A lot of people do it. Uh, the Hanging Church and Ben Ezra Synagogue are in Coptic Cairo. Um, the Ben Ezra synagogue has been closed for restoration for a long time. Um, actually it just reopened the other day when this itinerary was generated, it was still closed, but they didn't know that because these things are not published. So we've just known forever that Ben Ezra synagogue has been closed. We've been waiting for it to reopen. They don't, you know, we didn't know, they, they didn't say when it was going to reopen. It was just whenever they happened to finish and planned like an opening ceremony, then it reopened one day. Um, and now it's open again. So, 
Uh, it actually got this wrong when it spit this out. It happens to be right by coincidence now. Even a broken clock is right two times a day. So um, anyway, and then the Kano Kalili, you can do that any night, actually. That's not a bad, or any day, uh, but I recommend it in the evening. Um, so eh, that fits. Then it says day 10 in Cairo again. Visit Al-Azhar Park, a beautiful green space in the heart of Cairo. I've never heard of anybody visiting the park itself. We go to lunch a lot of times at the al Azhar restaurant, al Azhar Park restaurant. Uh, you can see the park and you can see views of the Citadel and Cairo from there. But I've never really heard. I mean, Egyptian families kind of go spend the day in the park and it's it's sort of a family outing thing to do. But I've never heard of tourists going to that park. Um, there, If you're going to want to go see beautiful places, there are other places to go as a tourist. But, um, you know, it, it's... It's a park, and so ChatGPT probably thinks, um, oh, go visit a nice green park while you're in Cairo. Not what I would do, at least not this park. Um, then it says take a cooking class to learn how to prepare traditional Egyptian dishes. Taking a cooking class is not a bad idea if you're in Egypt. It's something unique. A lot of people like to do things like that when they travel internationally. A lot more people are starting to request it, actually, as well. However, I think it threw this in here in Cairo because it assumed that doing something like this that's unique would be uh, best done in the largest city in the country. I actually always have folks do a cooking class in Luxor. Luxor is a much better place to do it. You can do it in Cairo. Luxor, though, it's just, for a lot of reasons, I would just have, I always do have folks do it in Luxor if they want to do a traditional Egyptian cooking class. Um, that's pretty much it. This itinerary concludes with saying, well, it says, this itinerary covers all the major historic and cultural sites and monuments in Egypt. It does not. From the Pyramids of Giza and the Sphinx to Karnak Temple and the Bibliotheca Alexandrina. It also includes some unique experiences, such as a hot air balloon ride, which they, they have you doing after they're not available anymore at a time when it would kill you. Um, and the Nile Faluka boat ride at sunset, which wasn't a bad idea, and at least they won't have you do it when it'll kill you, like they're trying to have you do the hot air balloon. Anyway, okay, that was the first itinerary that Chad GBT spit out, and as you can see, it was a hot mess. So let's see what the next test was like. Again, I asked it for a 10 day itinerary, and this is what it told me to do the second time around. Okay, day one, arrival in Cairo. Uh, let's see, it says, arrive in Cairo, check into your hotel, spend the afternoon exploring the vibrant Kano Kalili market, and the evening enjoy a dinner cruise on the Nile River. Oh boy. Okay, first of all, this is assuming that you're arriving in the morning or early afternoon. If you arrive late in the evening, you're not going to be able to do anything. You could do the Kano Kalili, most people are really tired. The Kano Kalili is one of the few things that you can do late because it's not a site that closes at a certain hour. It's an outdoor market that's really almost open 24 hours. So you could do that on your first night if you want to. We normally have people do it at the end of their Cairo stay for a variety of reasons. But, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing it on your first night. Um, okay, now dinner cruise. And, no, 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 no. Don't do a Nile dinner cruise in Cairo. The boats that do them are nasty. They're big mass market, cheap package holiday type experiences. I mean, you, most of them, you smell gasoline and diesel from the engine. I've literally seen cockroaches on some of these boats. I mean, I'm not kidding. Like actual cockroaches on the boats crawling around in the dining room. Um, yeah, I've just never met a Cairo Nile dinner cruise. That I liked, and I've seen a lot of them. So that's never something I recommend. I never put anybody on those boats. I never recommend anybody take those boats. The the Nile uh, dinner cruise boats in Cairo. I'm talking about. The only thing I would do that's some, somewhat related to that is I have chartered a smaller boat for folks sometimes to do a private dinner on a private boat. Um, they're boats that I know that I know are nice. We know the owners. We know where the food is coming from. And so if you want a Nile dinner cruise in Cairo, talk to me about how to make that happen because the charter boat 
because do not go on one of those big mass market, nasty, jank, null dinner cruise boats in Cairo. Okay, let's see. It has day two, pyramids of Giza and Cairo tour. Hmm. All right, visit the pyramids of Giza and the Sphinx. Explore the ancient capital of Memphis and the necropolis of Saqqara. At least it got that in there this time. Visit the Egyptian Museum in the afternoon and see the ancient artifact. No, no, no. no. Okay. Uh, where do I begin? First of all, what I like to do and what we always do if we can is split the pyramids. And I'm, I'm saying pyramids, plural, as in pyramid sites, Giza, Saqqara, Dashur. We, sp we split the pyramid sites into two different days, time permitting. If somebody needs to go see all those sites in one day, we can do it, but it's not preferable. Um, because three sites in one day out in Western Giza is a long day, and you just don't have as much time at these sites as you really want and that we want you to have. And so we really push folks to split pyramids. If you want to see more than just the Giza pyramids uh, out in Giza, split them into two days. Take your time. Enjoy it. Go at a leisurely pace. Don't be rushed. Don't feel like you are going to have regrets or you've missed something or you had to rush through something. This has you going to three sites. And the interesting thing, again, is they have you going to Memphis uh, as the third site. I would not go to Memphis. As the, I would go to Dashur. But if you, I mean, if you want to go to Memphis, do it on like a third day. Um, Memphis is just not a top site. But they think it is. So it has you going to the Giza pyramids, Memphis, Saqqara, which Saqqara is a huge site. And all of that must be in the morning because then they say, visit the Egyptian museum in the afternoon, see ancient artifacts, including King Tut's treasures. No, it's not possible. They're not obviously realizing the distances between these sites. Um, and also how much is at these sites? Memphis is a quick site. Maybe that's why they keep throwing it in, but it's actually really far south. Like it takes a long time to get there. Saqqara is, it takes a long time to get there too. It's a huge site. The Giza pyramids and Sphinx. I mean, that's where you want to spend most of your time. That's the thing you came to Egypt for. Uh, doing, cramming all of that into a morning. That's just beyond ridiculous. And then expecting you're going to have time to go see the Egyptian museum in the afternoon. No. That's not going to happen. Not going to happen. You try to do it. You're going to wind up bumping up against the closing time. You're going to not get to go to the Egyptian museum. You're going to rush through the pyramids. You're going to rush through Saqqara. You're going to be disappointed at Memphis. You're going to get to the Egyptian museum and realize it's closed or closing in a few minutes by the time you get there. Keep in mind, these sites close usually about five o'clock. So this day is a hot mess. Day three, it says Luxor. Take an early morning flight to Luxor. Actually, that it got right. Most days, there are many flights to Luxor from Cairo and Aswan, uh, Cairo to Aswan, all day long. Now, if you go look right now for flights in September, October, November, they're likely going to only be two or three because that's starting high season, and they tend to book up really far in advance, like six to eight months in advance. If you go look now, you might only have two or three flights available. Um, you might only have evening flights or super, super early morning flights, but at least... Um, between Cairo and Hergada, Cairo Luxor, Cairo Aswan, Cairo Sharm, there are flights all day long, multiple flights all day long. So you can take an early morning flight to Luxor on this day. Visit Karnak Temple and explore Luxor Temple in the evening, beautifully illuminated at night. Okay, well, at least it got one thing right about this day. You should visit Luxor Temple and Karnak Temple in the same day. They're both on the East Bank. They're co-located on the same side of the river. Uh, that is an efficient use of time and efficient routing. And they're both worth seeing. Now, if you try to go to Luxor Temple at night, you're not going to get in. Yes, it is illuminated at night. Yes, it is open late. But by late, we mean instead of closing at 5, it closes at 7. Yes, the lights stay on after that, but just because the lights are on inside doesn't mean the temple is open to go into. It is open late, so this can get a bit confusing because people think, oh, it's open late. Oh, the lights are on even later. Um, yeah, you can go at night. You can go walk around it from the outside at night, but if you try to go to Luxor Temple and go inside of it and visit it at night, you're going to be disappointed because it's going to be closed. 
you're going to be only be able to see the lights on from the outside of the temple as you walk around the perimeter, the outside wall. So again, um, they, they seem not to know that. Um, West Bank of the Nile on day four. Valley of the Kings, Valley of the Queens, Hatshepsut's Temple, Colossi of Memnon, Sunset for Lucas L. They actually got this day pretty spot on. Um, these are the top three things, unlike the previous itinerary, these are the top three things to see in Luxor on the West Bank, Valley of the Kings, uh, Hatshepsut's Temple, Colossi of Memnon. And then a lot of people do go see Valley of the Queens also because you have uh, Nefertari's tomb in there as well, which is a spectacular tomb. It's expensive to get in. The ticket's expensive. But we always uh, send our folks there and pay for it because it's worth it to go see it. Um, next day it says Aswan. Okay. Travel by train or car and check into your hotel. Okay. As I said in the last itinerary, traveling between Luxor and Aswan by train is becoming more and more appealing because they have new trains on the tracks here in Egypt. Uh, by car, I mean, they don't tell you how here because the thing is, if you try to travel between Luxor and Aswan by car, you can't just jump in a taxi and go to Aswan from Luxor. That is a controlled road, many checkpoints. You have to have a permit. You have to be traveling with a licensed permitted driver in a car with the right type of license plate. I'm not kidding about all this stuff. This really is how logistics work on the ground in Egypt. Um, if you're in the wrong type of car, uh, if you are not with a, a licensed driver for tourism, meaning they are allowed to drive foreigners, if you don't have a permit as a foreigner to travel on that road, you're going to get turned around and not be able to do it. Also, these permits have to be done 24 hour, uh, 48 hours in advance. So you can't just show up, say, I want to go to Aswan today, or even I want to go to Aswan tomorrow by road. Let me find a car, have somebody take me, and then it work out. It just doesn't happen that way. These are controlled areas. These are military checkpoints. These are security checkpoints. They want to make sure they know who is traveling, only the uh, you know, people they want to let through or let through. You have to have a permit to go on a lot of these roads, especially in the south of Egypt. So, I mean, they don't go into detail here, obviously, but, you know, just saying, oh, travel to Aswan by car. Uh, you'd have that would have to be arranged in advance with the right permits. It says then visit Philae Temple in the High Dam and explore the Nubian Museum. OK. Philae Temple, as I've said, is the number one site in Aswan itself to visit. Good to go there. The Aswan High Dam. No, um, you'll see this one on a lot of lists. Okay. A lot of people do say it's one of the top two or three sites in Aswan to go see. It's honestly because there's not a lot in Aswan to go see. They're kind of, you know, filling out the list. The Aswan High Dam is an important site for Egyptians. It's historically important. It really, um, changed the landscape uh, for Egyptians logistically in a lot of ways. I'm not going to go into that now, but it's important to them. They like to boast about it. They're proud of it. Um, a foreigner, especially from the West, you're not going to be impressed by it. I mean, I'm just being honest. I wouldn't waste my time. Uh, it's not scenic. It's, I mean, it's just a concrete low, it's called the high dam, but it's pretty low by our standards. Um, dam with a road on top. It's just nothing special. So a lot of people go to it and they're kind of like, uh, this is it. The Egyptians are proud of it, but you know, I'm being honest about, uh, tourists, foreigners visiting Egypt. And that's just the reality of some things. Um, the Nubian museum, it also says now that is, uh, something that I recommend. It's a small museum, but it's unique and nice and modern. And it, chronicles the history of southern Egypt, what we call upper Egypt, because it's up the Nile. Because remember, the Nile flows south to north. So upriver on the Nile, upper Egypt, um, which borders Nubia, the ancient kingdom of Nubia. So you do have a lot of mixing between Egyptians and Nubians back in ancient times. And this is the area in which that mixing was done. There were pharaohs that were Nubian. Some Egyptian dynasties were Nubian. Um, but this is a really neat museum uh, that's only available in Aswan that tells the story of the Nubian civilization and the Nubian people. Now it does say also experience the local culture and traditions. I think it's talking about Nubian, 
local culture and traditions. This is where it's worth it to say a lot of people, you, well, you'll see on lists as well on the internet, a lot of people will tell you if they've been here once uh, to go see the Nubian village. I hate to say that I don't recommend that anymore because what used to be a really quaint, charming, colorful, whimsical area, about 45 minute boat ride south of Aswan, once it started getting popular about eight years ago, it started turning into a more commercialized area. They started building more buildings. Uh, and then COVID happened and they just abandoned them. So now they're half built buildings all over the place. Uh, there's camel crap and donkey crap all over the streets because um, they like to bring camels out there and donkeys to make the tourists ride them and get extra money. They've thrown up touristy trinkety kiosks all over the little village and um, they're blocking a lot of the colorful, whimsical walls and doors that made that village so unique and worth the 45 minute boat ride down there. So I don't recommend the Nubian village anymore. That's unfortunate because I really used to like it and I would love to be able to recommend it again. But until they clean the area up, until they sort of clean the act up down there and stop trying to just throw touristy trinkety kiosks up everywhere, um, that's just not something I would waste my time on right now. If that changes, I mean, I do go down there mm, about once a year. If that changes, I certainly will maybe even do a full podcast on that and let you know and talk about the Nubian Village. But for now, the Nubian Village, I just don't recommend taking time out of your schedule to go see. Then, let's see. Abu Simbel. Okay. Take an early morning flight to... Uh, it's problematic. I'll tell you why. Take an early morning flight to Abu Simbel, home to the impressive temples of Ramses II, yes. Um, enjoy an afternoon at leisure in Aswan. Uh, relax in the Nile. Visit local markets, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Here's the thing about early morning flights to Abu Simbel. They're often canceled. Egypt Air has two flights a day from Aswan to Abu Simbel. And a lot of times that earlier flight does, or one of the flights doesn't book up, so they'll consolidate everybody onto the later flight. Now, here's why that's problematic. Well, number one, because they don't tell you this is likely going to happen. It happens a lot. But the other reason is because if you only have one day in Aswan and you plan, you, you book that early flight, the 8 a.m. flight, so you're back by about like noonish, so that you can spend the afternoon in Aswan doing other things like seeing Philae, the Nubian Museum. And then they cancel that early morning flight and put you on the later flight. You're not going to get back to Aswan until about 3. If the plane's a little bit delayed, 3.15, 3.30, that you're getting out of the airport. So you're not going to have time to go to Philae. The, the boat dock to Philae closes at 4 o'clock. So you're not going to be able to get on the boat and go to Philae um, if you have an early morning flight to Aswan and it's canceled and you're put on the later flight. That happens more than I wish it did. Um, but it's just a reality of dealing with logistics in Aswan and Abu Simbel. Again, that's not something, you know, Egypt Air is not going to tell you we often cancel this flight. It's just something that we know from experience because we deal with a lot of Abu Simbel rescheduled flights. So, um, again, if you're doing Abu Simbel with the early morning flight, hope it works out. Nile, cru Nile cruise for two days. Okay. This is not realistic. So they have you going on a big mass market now cruise boat, which I don't recommend. I recommend Dahabeas. I'll do a whole other uh, podcast on Dahabeas because they're unique to Egypt. If you've never been to Egypt, you've probably never heard of them, but that's how you should do a Nile cruise. I'll explain that in a future podcast. This has you doing one of the big mass market boats and only two nights. I've never heard of a two night Nile cruise on those big boats or even on a Dahabea, but uh, okay. So I hope you didn't book a ticket home after that because you're probably not going to find a two night cruise. Um, if you do, it's like a rare one-off thing and oh goodness. Okay. After this phantom two night cruise that doesn't exist, they have you doing Luxor in one day and it gets worse. Okay. First of all, you do Luxor. Time permitting, you do Luxor in two days. That's the ideal. You do an East Bank day and a West Bank day. The temple's on the East Bank, the tomb's on the West Bank. Um, there, there's a way, there's a, there's a routing, an ideal routing for doing Luxor. But you really need to split it over two days. Occasionally, people only have one day, and we have to do Luxor in one day, the East Bank day and West Bank day crammed into one. Usually, those are folks coming over from the Red Sea on a day trip to Luxor. But if you are 
flying to Luxor, if you're taking a boat into Luxor, uh, splitting the West Bank Day and the East Bank Day over two days is definitely the ideal way to go. Now, on the West Bank, it's the tombs, you know, like I said, the Valley of the Kings, Valley of the Queens, um, the Mortuary Temple of Queen Hatshepsut. On the East Bank, it's going to be Karnak Temple, Luxor Temple, the big things to see. This itinerary doesn't have you seeing any of that. In the one day, they have you cram all of Luxor in, East Bank and West Bank. They don't even have you go see any of those top sites. Incredible. They they have you going to see Medina Habu and Ramesseum, like the ninth and 10th, 15th, 16th maybe site down the list that I would go see if I had one day in Luxor. Anyway, there you have it, folks. Then it says, depart from Luxor Airport with memories and photos last a lifetime. You're going to have memories of all the places you didn't get to see and you regret following this itinerary uh, on and photos of tertiary sites that, uh, I mean, folks, seriously, if this is what chat GPT is spitting out when it comes to itineraries to destinations like Egypt, um, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, don't rely on it. Don't trust, uh, your trip of a lifetime that you know is, you know, you know, Egypt's a complicated destination. You know, it has some complicated logistics. You know, it requires research and due diligence. Um, this is just not a resource that honestly I can recommend folks follow even generally. I mean, if this were, if we ask it for an itinerary for London or Paris, it's going to give you, you know, some, some top sites. It's going to give you some interesting cafes that are talked about a lot on the internet and therefore probably the most popular. It may give you some, some, uh, detailed routes. Uh, it may give you some train times and things like that, that you can incorporate into the schedule. All that stuff is published out there. It's on the internet. It's scrapable for AI and chatbots to pick up on and analyze and incorporate it into the outputs it gives to you and its recommendations. This is just not the case for the landscape in a place like Egypt. So again, think about the quality of the inputs out there, and that's going to affect the quality of the outputs of tools like ChatGPT and AI tools uh, for travel planning. That's just my two cents. So there you have it, folks. Straight from the advanced chatbot's mouth. As you can see, artificial bots may be able to string together a list of sites that are near each other in the West, in the US, but it's not going to be the case for Egypt. The bots can scrape the internet and read all of that and incorporate it into what it recommends, but the fact remains that it's just not the case in developing countries that this information is out there and available and scrapable. Or if it is, it could be outdated. That's the case with Egypt as well. There's a lot of outdated information out there. The ministries don't necessarily have the capacity to keep up, to keep their websites updated. Uh, to keep putting the, you know, changing times, changing requirements, changing conditions, uh, things like that out there. You know, there's a lot of travel blogger content out there, but these are people who've been to Egypt once and they write about it and then things change. I'm actually going to be doing another episode on money where I've seen this happen, where some travel blogger will write about, you know, oh yeah, pay this amount to go to the airport. This amount should be for a taxi. This amount should be for this, but that might've been three or four years ago. I mean, just to clue you in a little bit, the pound, the Egyptian pound changed uh, three times last year, I think. So, um, and, and not for the better. So if you're reading something that's two, three, four years old, and a lot of travel blog content can be up to, you know, eight or 10 years old now, when it comes to Egypt, chances are it's probably severely out of date. So this is just what we deal with when we are, you know, dealing with travel planning to Egypt. So bottom line be very cautious, be very skeptical when using tools like ChatGPT to make travel plans in the developing world, at least right now, but especially right now in the Middle East and Africa, parts of Asia, and especially in Egypt. Maybe in the future, it'll get there if Egypt decides to start putting all this stuff online. But for security reasons, for logistical reasons, for capability reasons, for other reasons, I'd bet they're not going to be able to do that anytime soon. But I'm not going to leave you in the dark. You can still tune in here to the Egypt Travel Podcast for everything you need to know about travel to and around Egypt. Until next time, my friends, ma salama.